Who's only here because their parents told them to come out here? Okay, a lesser group. That's right. good. That's good. Look, I love the different world because it showed me college is about having a good time. Yes, we need to be in class. Yes, we need to be studying. Right. But you're never going to get four years like this again, right? <laughs> Not at all. And while we're up here, let's get a little dorm, you know, oh, participation. Yeah. It's rest fest. Let, it's let's rest see who's fest, the best dorm. I already know who the best dorm is, but who's it's the best okay. Dorm? Name three couples. What? Couples. From a different world. Okay. Okay, so we got Dwayne, and we got Whitley, we got uh, Ron, and we got Freddie. Then we got uh, uh, Lucky, and we got Lena, because they were not in high school. Good! Okay, she knows! That's number one. We'll give her a point, you know what I'm saying? Ding on the board. Alright. Where's my mic up? There we go. Alright. Now, this is a question for all of you. What show is A Different World a spin off of? Cosby Show. That is correct. That's great. That's great. And now, for an extra point, who, what character from the Cosby Show? Okay. Denise Huxtable. All right, all right, that is correct. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. This is a hard one. So let's see who actually watched the show. What was hanging from Denise's mobile for her dorm room? Ooh. A towel? Uh, Alright, that was the episode we watched, dog. Uh, I know what you're talking about. We watched that episode. Yes. What was hanging from Denise's mobile from her dorm room? Yeah. Above her bed. Some, some weird. Was it like a skeleton? Close. See? Yes! That is correct! That is correct! No, I didn't do that. You didn't know that. <laughs> Alright. This is... What commodity did Whitney find out that her family owned? Slave. That is correct! Willie's family did own slaves in the past. You know, if you got if you got a friend that's mixed, check on them. That's all I'm gonna say. If you got a mix, both my parents black. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all. Amen. Amen. Okay, this is gonna test who actually watched the show. As a third generation Huxtable at Hillman. Oh God! What sport did Denise participate in? Ooh. Track, track, track! Oh, yeah. That is okay, correct. I have two. It was track. Track. Mm -hmm. track. So my two friends here are both at two. Next one gets a, their ticket secure. All right. Let's go, Aria. Let's go. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on. A cute one? What you think? Oh, okay. Um, no, that's a good one. 
What university was a different world? Film that. That's false. Alright, hands down, hands down, hands down, hands down, hands down, hands down. We gotta do this fair, y'all. What university was a different world filmed at? Bournemouth. No. Spellman. Yes. There it is. There it is. My Spellman. She got, she got her ticket, y'all. Okay, we have one more ticket to give out. My friend here has two points. My friend here has one, one, and zero, but there's still a fair chance, okay? Okay, now we're going to move on from a different world. We're going to ask you some questions about Howard. Name a building on this campus that is a federally protected monument. I am. Library. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, two, two, one, and zero. All right. Come on, y'all. The next All one right. gets their ticket. All right. No, 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 we're doing this, we're doing this. Mm. Mm. I know, I want to give y'all something good, y'all. Okay. The second, ooh, how many, okay. How many schools did Howard University have? Undergraduate and graduate. It counts. It counts. And, and name them. We'll do undergraduate, not graduate. Thirteen. It's thirteen. Nah, it is thirteen. Name him. Nah, he ain't. He asked me a name. He asked me how many schools it is. It's thirteen. Fourteen. Fourteen. My dad. My dad. Got you. Got you. We got a good question. Good question. No, 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 no. Name. Y'all ready? Everybody hands down. What is the name of the president of Howard University? opportunity to welcome the cast of A Different World. Now I know we at Howard get recognized for a lot of things. Uh, charter days, commencements, homecoming, but on a random Tuesday night in April, <laughs> at Howard University you have the chance to have an encounter with amazing individuals such as this. Now for me, this is absolutely uh, uh, incredible. I have to say, much like Nia, I, I had the uh, incredible pleasure of watching A Different World, but I didn't see it 14 years ago. I, I saw it a little bit longer than that. Uh, I had the privilege of seeing it uh, as I was in high school, uh, in, 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 as it was running. this in the audience, but I remember going home uh, trying to get through my homework quickly. 
quickly so that when the hour came on Thursday night, I would be free and able to digest the fun, the laughter, the camaraderie, and the lessons that were imparted from this incredible show. I also want to recognize tonight the contributions of Howard alumni, alumna Debbie Allen. She, of course, uh, is the sister of fellow alumna and our beloved Dean. And she herself made an appearance, or two, on A Different World, if I can remember correctly. I also uh, would like to recognize our sponsors tonight, Cisco. Now, let's get this Hillman homecoming started! As the lovable and kooky Sinclair on Living Single. Can I talk to all the bisons? Where are the bisons in the house? So to all the bisons and bisonettes, <laughs> you know. I have to tell you, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I kind of know because I was accepted to attend Howard University. I was accepted. So I was almost in, but my parents told me they couldn't afford to send me here. So. because back in my day it wasn't that expensive. My parents told me they couldn't afford to keep me in the fashions I was going to need to wear coming to this school. Because y'all be real fashionable. So I got a chance to be here now and that's what happens. That's what's happening. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So I'm going to read what's on the card because I'm sweating. I'm going to be doing this and I'm going to be reading at the same time because I'm in menopause too because all things happen. They need to teach that about, teach that about in college. So we're all here because a different world has impacted everyone in this audience, and I would say everybody across the globe. And we're gonna to talk to everyone here tonight, and we're gonna talk about the show's legacy and continuing revelance. I said revelance earlier, but the world is re relevance. It's re revelance and revelance. The reverence for the relevance. I told y'all they didn't let me go to school with y'all. And we're gonna talk about how a Different World remains one of the highest rated one of the highest rated shows in the country to this day. <laughs> All right. Now, I believe there's a montage coming. Is there a montage? Is there a montage? <laughs> Uh-oh, another letter from your mystery valentine. Yes, but 
this one is even more romantic. <clears throat> Let our souls hover like a mist over the lagunas of a new consciousness. with my science project. And watch the glass. <laughs> Next time you come dressed to fight. Come on. Let's go with me. divorced me because I couldn't dance. What? <laughs> now, you see, the joke is on her because, well, now check this out. Mm. Denise, honey, this isn't moving at all because my back is locked. Who cares about the stars in the skies? I have stars in my eyes. I made an A in my marketing class. And I owe it all to Dwayne. What did he do? <laughs> it's not what he did, Cam. It's, it's who he is. My man. My man. Better when she was alone and crabby. Yeah, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, Whitley is the one doing the I said, hurt me, baby. Is she coming? She's waiting for 
for an entrance, y'all. She waited for her entrance, her entrance. Here comes another entrance. Jasmine. The second step on this tour? That is correct. Second stop, and uh, wanted to come here and give you all the love and so much excitement. So we have a great evening planned for you. Um, I want to talk about the chemistry that you all have as human beings, but also as a cast. Did you all feel that chemistry right away? Because we did. Did you all feel it right away when you started working? Anybody jump in? Absolutely. Uh, Daryl, Jasmine, and I, we met on school days. Yeah. <laughs> birth there and then once we all got dropped into a different world it kept going and they we got met dawn and then Cree came and Charlie and Glenn and it was just it was well, magic. Cree and I we came together we were together when we came in we came together second season, we came in second season. that's right as a duo when I remember I had such a crush on Kitty oh. <laughs> we getting right to it and I also have to say, I was love at first sight with Jasmine and I. And um, just, it was really like going to school. I did go to college, and I, but I did, I went to help. And, and as Kadeem talks about, we met at school days in 1987. We played interviews at school days. Okay. We played best friends on a different world. But in real life, I'm godfather to his daughter. You know, because a lot of that, you know, we see the chemistry, we hope that everybody loves each other and gets along and creates family, and so it's, isn't it wonderful to see and hear that this really is true? Yeah. I think that's what makes it work, right? True blue and tight like blue. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's talk about the comedy of the show. And um, did any of you have any comedy experience other than, you know, like acting and comedy? Did, Cree, did you have some comedy experience? Oh, well, I had done uh, cartoons, you know. Funny yeah. cartoons. Yeah. And I would say that's where I was breaking my comedy chops, was probably doing animation. Yeah. 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 Doing number five. Yeah. Anybody else have any comedy experiences? Again, you were actors, you were dancers, you were singers, you were songwriters. Hello? Uh, anybody else have that comedy experience? Because My you know. grandmother was real funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I got it from her. You got it from her. That was it. I think Sinbad was the only one yeah. that was really a comedian. Really 
And he always complained about not being funny enough. You know, because as a comedian, the last thing you want to do is not be funny on a sitcom. I thought he was funny, but he would do so much um, improv and better lines after the real line, you know, that wasn't always put on air, but it was really fun working with him. He was constantly thinking of other ways to do it, you know. Did it keep you on your toes? I was just about to say that. He kept us on our toes. When I saw that we were with him that in a scene, I'm like, oh, snap. Well, you have to every, be ready at all every, times with him. I, I was gonna say, every show that has comedy writers have jokes, okay. but we had a certain stir in our drink that really unleashed the funny. And she. What she say? We'll read just an audio now. You mean the one who helped the show, our bison sister Debbie Allen? <laughs> you mean the one that we have a clip of right now? Yes, that one. Now, Debbie Allen, do we have a captain. clip? broken record and sing a new song, honey. Well, what am I supposed to do, doctor? <laughs> you gotta go find that ex-boyfriend of yours, look him in the eye, and close that chapter of your life. And then relax, relate, release. <laughs> relax, relate, relate. And then go and find that Dwayne and rediscover what was so wonderful about him before it's too late. timing was beautiful, it was perfect, and that's from a long line of theater, which I come from, so I had done comedy in theater before, and uh, so to get on and meet these young people who were sharpening their teeth and to have an old pro like Lou Myers around to uh, show them the ropes, so to speak, and always depend on, that was magical, that was magical. a magical, magical kind of thing. We say his name, and Chanel, a lot of folks don't know this, you're an acting coach now, an acting teacher. Is there something that Lou Myers taught you that you use with your students to this day? Lou used to, I, God, I miss Lou so much, but he always used to tell me, jokingly, be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. Just be true to yourself. Kimberly Reed, be true to yourself. <laughs> Kimberly Reed. Kimberly, be, be, true to yourself. be true to yourself. I think that's advice that we all can use. Be true to yourself, all right? Are we being true to, the, to Debbie Allen coming through? <laughs> Hello, Debbie Hi, Allen. can you all hear me? Debbie, am I allowed to ask you where you are right now? Where are thou? <laughs> I don't think she can hear us. So I have 
happy to know that Debbie Allen is on a break as she's directing Grey's Anatomy right this moment. Now she can hear. Yes, we can. Yes, we hear. There you go. Thank you for taking I some love time. It. Thank you. you know. <laughs> yes, we know. So we know that, and we're glad that we know. Debbie, talk about your time on this iconic show and adding your special flavor to the to to, to the show. So I think it's audio difficulty because I can't hear you. I've been watching you all for the last few minutes and excited to see all those faces that I love so much and know that you have my alma mater, Howard University, which was a beautiful, different world, if anything was, that I was a student there and all those experiences actually lived on our screen uh, on a different world. And uh, the relevance of our show has so much to do with the artistry of all those wonderful actors that are sitting on the stage with you right now, for the writers, and the voice of Black America, young Black America. So, I don't know if this can keep going, just a one-way street conversation, but I just wanted to say I love you guys so much. I'm so excited that the tour is going so well. I'm looking forward to joining you in the next couple of days. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there, Howard, but you all are there, and that's everything. And so, thank you for including me. Thank you. Wasn't that nice? Nice surprise. There might be some more surprises. So, um, apparently there's another bison. That was a bison moment. Would you like another bison moment? Okay. Roll that clip, please. Roll that other clip. It's on the car. I'm just doing what they told me to do. Most of the time. to me. Stop. I don't want to get interrupted. Okay, so keep going. So, um, I'm making work. Because we got a, a little special thing that's about to happen, isn't it? Okay. So, okay. so we're getting that together. <laughs> Is it coming? <laughs> We are staying on track. As you see, there's a lot that goes on to me. They, they didn't just show up looking cute. They did that. But production showed up. Um, we've been getting ready for you all, and we're just getting the audio together. We want to make this really beautiful. So give a hand to everybody in production who's making this happen. One of the things I was happy to know is that enrollment in HBCUs doubled during the time that you all were on the air. chance to attend here, but I come from a family of educators who were educated at HBCU, so I know the value of that. Can you all talk about the impact of that? Dawn, do you have something? It's been amazing. Uh, when we were doing the show, um, I didn't go to an HBCU because when I was being counseled for college, we, it just wasn't an option that they presented. We had seen those commercials of mine as the terrible thing you waste from the UNCF, which just made sense to me. So when, you, when we experience what you learned by watching our show, a lot of us got the same education by doing our show. I learned what an HBC was while doing A Different World and what the environment was and the importance of it. And the way it empowers us to see ourselves, to encourage each other, and to dare to be your best self as a young person of color in this country. And we couldn't be more challenged. We are being so challenged right now with our history being erased, with people trying to minimize our contributions. So this environment where we are and shows like ours that give us the audacity to be excellent. The audacity to be excellent. Uh, anybody else want to speak to that? Do you, did you, were you aware that that was happening as you were doing this? I certainly had an awareness, although I went to a PWI. 
I went to Syracuse University. But I played at South for five hours. Hey, buddy. Oh, six. And I got some of my friends in the house tonight. Some of my Syracuse fan, wait. Y'all right here, there we go. And even though there were 15,000 students at Syracuse, there were only 800 black students. But it felt like we were at an HBCU. Because we all knew each other. We all partied together. We all studied together. And they graduated together. <laughs> what happened to you, Darren? I got a job on TV. Yeah, sure did. That's not going to be everybody's path, but that happened for me. But it was the time that I spent, particularly in my experience with Alpha Phi Alpha, when I first came onto campus as a freshman. There was a brother named Mac Rice, who was the head of the African American Society. And on our yard, he was organizing a protest against apartheid. And I was like, who is this brother? And what is that little A, zero, A on his chest? But all I knew when I found out that Alphas were supposed to be about scholarship and community activism and all that, and he was living it, I wanted to be a part of that. And suddenly, you know, at Syracuse, we started hosting the Greek Freak. We were stepping. We would travel to HBUs, HBCUs to pick up steps and bring them back to Syracuse. So we, I had the, the experience to be on multiple campuses, and that helped me with everything that we did from there on. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for the work that you did. You, you, know, you booked a gig and didn't know, well, maybe you did know that there was going to be an extra impact that happened that lasts for forever and forever and forever into this. I mean, I'm looking at your big heads, not your big heads here, but they're holding your big heads. Oh, look at the love. Look at that. It lasts for forever. Your big, your big beautiful hands. Speaking of big beautiful hands, we have that clip. That's a terrible segue. <laughs> There might be some big heads in the clip, I don't know. No, we don't. All right, <laughs> I'm still not gonna be asked back. Um, <laughs> let's talk about, uh, so we know that the enrollment in, um, uh, doubled. Um, we know that there was a cultural impact. Do you all wanna touch on, or does anybody wanna touch on um, the cultural impact, more of the cultural impact that we had to see black folks doing black things. And that, that other folks got to see us do these things. I think um, one of the impacts Dwayne had on, on the culture, I was the first real sneakerhead on television. Yeah. Yeah. Sneakerhead. Oh, okay. They didn't know about it. Will Smith wasn't around yet. Martin wasn't around yet. Marlon wasn't around yet. I was first. Me and this little guy over here. Yeah, I was about to say, wait a minute. It hurts. <laughs> if y'all go back to school days, Kadeem and I had the Jordans on, and I had them with black shoelaces the way they were made. And he took them out and put in white shoelaces. And we have argued about sneakers ever since. <laughs> I had to custom mine, I had to make a mine. And that was something that I let the wardrobe people dress me however they wanted. They picked all the outfits, and all I wanted control of was the sneakers. sneakers. So every week, I picked what footwear I would wait, what would wear, and they picked everything else. And it had a major impact on Mr. Jordan and his. Uh, and then, well, well, and, and, and then the kids from then on saw that and would look, see what I was wearing or what we were wearing. Right. We would do it purposely. If you watch A Different World, there were scenes where we would sit with the Nike swoosh right in the camera. Yep, commercial, instant. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, so that was one of the impacts uh, that was, you know, Lighthearted. Right. Yeah. So fashion, also yeah. music. Yeah. Uh, my girl Don Lewis. So just so you know, I grew up with Don Lewis. We went to camp together. I've known this woman since we were nine years old. Um, in fact, you all don't know this, but she invited me to the set long before I had a job. I got a chance to come and see. That's how I know the chemistry is real. I got a chance to be on the set with all of you. 
and I'm going to talk about your musical influence. You got to write the theme song. What's up with that? The theme song. I just knew I was going to be a recording artist. So I had been touring, I had a record out, had a band out, uh, was writing and recording with different artists, and was a session singer in New York. So the musical director of The Cosby Show knew me as a musician, singer, songwriter. So he contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in working with him on writing this new theme song for the spinoff of The Cosby Show. And it was on a Wednesday, he said we're going to be in the studio Friday. And I said, don't you want to meet first to hear what I wrote? And he says, no, if you wrote this material, you can do what I need done. That same day that he called me, I had just finished doing a national Broadway tour of the show, The Tap Dance Kid, that was cast by the same people they cast The Cosby Show. They finally called Y'all me back. Y'all give it up for Tap Dance Kid. Absolutely. They called me back after three months of begging, can I audition, and said, yes, you can come and audition tomorrow. I thought it was a joke. I was three days away from my last unemployment check. So to get a call from the casting director and the musical director in the, within the same hour was nothing but God. So flip two. Flip two. Seven days later, I'm in my final meeting and Mr. Cosby, they want to talk about the theme song. What do you think of the song? And the girl said, oh man, she's great. The words are perfect. This is exactly what we're looking for. It wasn't until that moment that I realized that they had no idea they had hired the same person wow. to be in the show that they had hired to write the theme song. So Can I say, I think writing those words, that was my personal journey. Of, I was 16 when I started college. So all I had to arm myself with was what I was taught by my family, by my circle, by my village, to go into the world and again, dare have the audacity to be excellent and do what it took to manifest and pour into what it would take for me to be the best me that I could be. Thank you. And you know, I hope, I hope y'all heard the lesson in that. It's your excellence in everything that you do, in everywhere that you go, and there are blessings awaiting you all the time. You heard that? You heard that. Speaking of blessings I available, can I say also to your impact, I have to say this, and I really do, I am so overwhelmed about representing the chocolate system. Come on, chocolate! so much for the love. Thank you so much. that has ever been on a number one show and went ahead and stepped on and did a number two show. How does that feel? Amazing, you know, uh, really an honor. So yes, started out on the Cosby Show and then came to Different World. Talk about the impact from your perspective about this show. Well, when I first saw the show, I was like, that's Howard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm in his house. So I, I knew it. I knew everything. I knew all the stepping that we do. I knew all the dorm life, all of the social protests. I mean, that's what we were doing. When I was here in the 80s, we were having sit-ins at the A building, okay? We were, we were fighting to have a black studies course for every freshman coming in. So I was part of that that generation that was fighting. 
And so I knew how much of an impact how it had on me um, as a black woman. I wanted to study, you know, with my people. I wanted to be able to do all the roles that I wanted to do. I wanted to know how good I was. I didn't want to go to a different school that wasn't, you know, that didn't celebrate me and didn't train me properly. So there's so many of us that came out of Howard Baby, including Debbie and Felicia, you know, uh, so many, so many of us here. Anthony Anderson, you know, so many. So I'm just so proud to be a bison, always, always. touched on something that was really powerful. Can you talk about going into spaces and staying in spaces where you are celebrated instead of tolerated? And you can touch on that and anybody else can touch on that. What is that like and how do we cultivate staying in spaces where we're celebrated and not just tolerated? I think when we're, when we go to an HBCU, we, we get that love, we get that nurturing, nurturing, um, we get to know who we are before we step out in the world and people try to define us. You know, this is where we learn to define who we are. And we go out in that world, you know, people talk about a lot of people from Howard got chips on their shoulders, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do, you know? Because we, we got that kind of nurturing where they like stand in your power. You know, they, they, they raise us and they teach us to go out in the world and to be our authentic selves and to win in every area. So there are bison all over the world. Baby. And, and, okay. Does anybody else want to talk about being in spaces where you are celebrated uh, and not just to tolerated? How do we do Care, that? I'll let, you know when, I'll let you know when I get in the one. Show you right. Come on, Glenn. Now, what, where, what, I don't know if you, and, and I'm not going to take us down the dark path, but I'm going to tell you what, what I'm going to do is celebrate our resilience. And let you know that the learning and the nurture, nurturing you're getting here is a very real and very important substance for you. It's a substance that once you, I don't know how many of you are, how many of you in the art department? Yeah! That, that, that'll work. Uh. <laughs> once you go out into the world and try to make a dollar of 98.50 in this business, uh, dynamics change. And what are those dynamics that change? Well, a lot of it is have to do with the color of your skin, but that's America, and that's just the nature of the beast, and you by now should know that. But what do you need to overcome the beast? You need courage. You absolutely need courage to overcome that beast. And where do you find that courage? Well, you. If I told you you found it from your mother and your father, you won't believe me. Because they don't know shit. <laughs> well, well. Okay, so let's start there and know that you have disregarded everything they've tried to tell you. <laughs> so now you're in college and you're finding out certain things that you might not know everything. You know most of everything, but you might not know everything. So now you're finding out what you don't know. And what you don't know is valuable. Find that out, because it's going to take courage to overcome that ignorance. Uh-oh. Yeah. He's dropping knowledge. What did he say? <laughs> It's going to take courage to let go. And when you let go in the world where people really don't care, you are vulnerable. So what's the first thing you're going to do as an artist? Well, do you protect that vulnerability and disregard it and guard it with cement walls about who you are and what you are and what you're letting into your life? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you can't do that if you want to be a good artist, because a good artist is about being vulnerable. So how do you protect yourself when you're going to be vulnerable for the world? When you're getting slapped around, when you're told no and people mean no. You can't persuade them to change your mind or cry baby your way into it or pout your way into it. No means no and you don't eat, you don't pay your rent. <laughs> You know, powerful topics, a lot of something someone someone might call controversy. So let's 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 dive into that a little bit. And you took it on powerfully. And you know, you and I talked yesterday about the fact that you know this is a sitcom, it's a situation comedy. And you all found a beautiful way to take the matters of the day, the topics of the day, what was important to the culture in general and to this culture in particular, and found ways to address them, address them beautifully, and that made us think that made us fall in love with you even more and helped us all to grow. So, there's a clip about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm working as hard as I can. Let's take a look at some of the controversy that you all took on so elegantly and eloquently. Roll the beautiful videotape. Oh, oh thank God. Wait, don't. Get oh. into it. Protected sex with my boyfriend junior year in high school. <laughs> 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 Nothing like an AIDS wound to teach you that youth is not for mortality. More than anything, youth is the power to make choices. I ask one thing of you. Remember, always to choose life. Thank you for your honesty. How long have you known? Since last summer. Mm. Let's talk about that episode. Mm. Daryl, what, what, what say you? Uh, taking that on. Um, that is such an impactful episode. And there was so much that was happening there, along with Whoopi Goldberg who came to us right after she had won the Oscar. And Tisha Campbell, before y'all knew Tisha Campbell, given one of the most amazing performances. And at the time, it was controversial, and you could not show a condom on TV. You could refer to it, you could point to it, you could reference it, you couldn't show it on TV. The fact that we were even going to address the subject matter of AIDS and HIV, sponsors were pulling their advertising from a different world. They were refusing, refusing to support it. This was a battle that Marcy Carsey, Tom Warner, Debbie Allen, and at the time Bill Cosby all fought with the network about our right to have this conversation. And then take it another step further. It was the arts community that was being devastated. If you look just on that screen between Whoopi, Tisha, and all of us, we had lost, there are members in our opening credits that we lost to AIDS. We had other people who worked on our stage that we lost to AIDS. We were all at Debbie Allen's house because Debbie had us over for parties at her house all the time when Magic Johnson announced he had HIV. And this was our friend to all of us, and it was devastating. So, to be on the front lines about the health and health for our community and to talk about the fact that even in that clip, the network insisted it had to be a female that contracted the disease. Mm. They wouldn't let it be a man. So when I tell you about the fights and everyone, the network and the courage of NBC to still air it, irrespective of whether or not advertisers moved out, it remains one of the similar moments in television history. in prime time. No one else had addressed it in prime, prime time before our show, yeah. A show of many, many firsts. Thank you, thank you for taking that on. 
there's another clip that I'm hoping comes. So thank you for taking that on. <laughs> another clip, come on through. I feel the clip game is on. They're on their clip game now. Watch. I uh, have a friend. Very bright painter. One day, he went blind. Whenever I start feeling sorry for myself, I think about him. He doesn't know it, but he's my inspiration. That story didn't really help me too much, Colonel. That story wasn't supposed to help you. That story helps me. I'm your own source of inspiration. Take care. Be strong. Yes. Blair Underwood, Glenn Turner. Glenn, would you like to comment on that? That episode? What is war about? What is war about? War is about killing and dying. Can you imagine? What a silly thing. It's absolutely, what is good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> And this young man is going off to war. And we've just had the, uh, which war was that one? It was, uh, it was the first Iraq war. I got, beat, I got beat up enough without having to talk like that. Um, when I went in for the audition for a different world, I went in for another role. I obviously didn't get it because the name of that role was Jaleesa. Oh. I love you too. So when I went in the second time, it was for another role, Sydney slash Whitley, they didn't even know the name yet. And I was reading the sides with my mother. And I read through them and I said, Mommy, is that funny? She said, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a sitcom. I said, I have to be funny. I can't go in there like I did the last time and not get this. What if I do it like Miss Panker? And that was my third grade teacher. And my mother started cracking up. And there it was. Then I had to work backwards and try to make that a reality. You know, why is she talking like that, first of all? Why is she talking like my um, white beehive third grade teacher in 1968, you know. I don't know, it's funny. <laughs> I had no idea that she looked like that. I love that you took her and you made her caramel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, once I got, um, and then the audition process was very quick. And I realized that I hadn't practiced the accent um, other than on the sides, you know. And for my callback, they gave me a two-page phone call monologue. And I was like, oh, that doesn't want me to get the part. And she did, but it was kind of obvious. Then after that, that was a Saturday, and then Monday, we had another um, audition, me and another actress. They put us in separate rooms, and we read for the network. And they said, one of you is going um, to set and the other one is going home. Oh, wow. It was it's just that little cool sometimes, y'all. Hollywood experience. Told you it's a tough business. Huh? It was a tough business. It is. It was cold blood. It was cold. Yeah. Why do you think that we relate to that character so much? Because we hadn't seen Whitley. We hadn't seen her, no. right? No. I was really worried that that character would not resonate with black people. I didn't really know a girl like that my experience, um, but I think, it, oh, and, and Kadeem and I were hired, and but the shows that we were in hadn't aired yet, so the show was was coming on, 
And so I didn't have a gauge of what that response would be like. And I was saying, you know, pretty mean things to Denise Huxtable's character. And I was trying to, um, you know, find my footing. But one thing we knew, I was a snotty brat, and he was chasing Denise Huxtable. We knew what we had to play. And I think that helped in that first year of the show, because it was kind of all over the place. People were, um, you know, we had like three dorm mothers before we got Mary Alice. We would come to work and somebody would be gone. It was a very stressful... Game of was, Thrones. Uh, <laughs> it's a like Game of Thrones. <laughs> it was very Game of Thrones. But having not done a sitcom before, I had a, a learning curve and um, we were just like, we were, we were contracted for seven episodes, and by episode five and six, we were like, what you think? You think we're going to, I said, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not moving out of my New York apartment. I know I saved that apartment in case we had to go back home. It was a very, um, it being all new, it was also a little stressful. And there was a lot of anxiety on the set because we weren't, getting any idea of why people were leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, when I when I started on a different role, my character was, was supposed to have a crush on Dwayne Wayne. And that was really my main objective uh, that the writers gave me. But the more that they spoke to me and discovered my background, I grew up on an Indian reservation. I lived on a school bus. I started school in the fourth grade. And uh, they j and my father was a big activist with the uh, AIM movement. He was on the very first Greenpeace boat, the Rainbow Warrior. And so activism was in my, it was hereditary. And before I knew it, I turned around maybe like middle of the second season and uh, Freddie was definitely very familiar. I was like, no mirror could be clearer than Freddie and I. I just want to say on a, on a personal and delicious note, um, you used to talk about the writing and, and doing other things on the show. Um, Living Single was a beneficiary of the excellence that happened on this show because Yvette Lee Bowser was a writer on their show. And she left, I'm sorry, she came over and she created Living Single. And so, and because she now had a position of, of power, she got a chance to hire all y'all. So most of y'all came and did, uh, did an episode or two of Living Single. So I love that the, 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 that we get to help each other in that way, and that's important. When you hear what they say about black folks, it's not true. We absolutely do help. The crab in the barrel, I, I like Maryland crab, but I don't know about the mother crab. show at the time and I grew up doing that but uh, we worked in a very tight group in a very tight shell in Brooklyn New York most shows almost all shows were taped in Los Angeles we were the only show of our type that was taped on the East Coast and we did our show in two and a half days uh, and uh, we worked at a tremendously fast pace and we were very isolated from the impact of the show. So it wasn't like we felt like we were on the number one show on television. I mean, we were working and do, going to school and doing our thing and we had some of the greatest uh, examples in front of us of excellence and grace and professionalism. Um, so when I got the chance to go to a different world, it was a little intimidating because I used to watch, the, we used to take the show at 8 o'clock on Thursday nights. And so 
I would watch A Different World between the sets of the living room and the kitchen on a little tiny monitor while we were taping because I could not miss you guys under any circumstances. And the stage manager's like, no, we got to keep this on the live feed. And I'm like, oh, no. What did Willie just say? I'm no, 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 no. So I was quite intimidated, actually, uh, when that storyline came up. And uh, Kadeem didn't make it any better for me. <laughs> so, for those who don't know, or if you haven't seen it, there's an episode where Vanessa comes to Hillman and ends up on a date with Dwayne Wayne while Claire Huxtable was there. And they had to play that out. Yes, and we danced, and I was supposed to laugh and giggle, and you know, I'm trying to sound flirty. And just to help me along with that process, Kadeem would, you know, jab me in the side or tickle me or twist my earlobe, or whatever it took to get a genuine reaction. Oh. Let me thank you for that, sir. <laughs> I think it worked. Anything I know of the art, I, I can say part of it is ah. due to you. But let, let me <laughs> ask, though, the, if, if we talk about the clip we just saw, yeah. for those who work here, work here who, those who are studying here in the performing arts and have had the opportunity to be mentored by Dean Felicia Rashad, yes. For four years, what was it like to be mentored by Dean Felicia Rashad as a nine-year-old and in that scene in particular? Well, when you're an actor, there are moments that you strive for. And I'm sure there are plenty of actors here in the audience tonight. <laughs> where you've done your work, you've learned your lines, you know your marks, but when you're in it, you want to fully be present. You want the lights to fade, the cameras to fade, all of that to go away, and everything that you're doing is real and genuine, and you're listening and reacting in truth. And it, you don't often get there, and that's okay. It's hard. It doesn't always come. And if you're a really talented actor, you have a toolbox, and sometimes you can you know, make somebody laugh, make somebody cry, but you know in your heart you weren't fully there. So in that scene, there's a moment that most people will remember, because they often criticize the show and said, they never yell at the kids. They, I mean, nobody gets up in anybody's ass. I mean, come on, you know, what's up? And when she got so angry with me during this particular scene, it was different than we had rehearsed it. And as I was sitting there, she got angrier and angrier and more furious. I started to feel more nervous, and the scene changed from what we had rehearsed. And then eventually, when I stand up and say, Mom, I apologize, she stepped right into my grill and screamed, Go to bed! And I just lost. My stomach dropped to the floor. I started crying. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't find the words. I reached to hug her. She stepped back. And I can't even remember the rest. I stumbled up the stairs, and then I stumbled back down the stairs. And so I was behind the set trying to gather myself. And they finished the scene. And then Dean Rashad came back behind the set and grabbed me and pulled me in her arms and said, I told you, you can do this. Aww. Dean Rashad keeps it working and popping at all times. And so just as I was about to bring her her flowers, and I planned this for weeks, guys, uh, she informed me that there was a dance rehearsal and she couldn't disappoint those students. So she had to jet and uh, she said, don't do any of this. Don't, do, oh, don't go out there and talk about me. And I said, no, nope, no. Nope. I will be going out there, and I will be talking about you, and I will be talking about the moment that let me know that this was something that I actually really could do. Like, if you were to attend an HBCU, which one would you choose? Choose wisely. H-U? Oh, my goodness. I do not know. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm from 
from Atlanta, so I feel obligated to say Spellman or Clark. You understand? Glenn, how about you? Tuskegee. Tuskegee. Oh, that makes sense, right? Nice, nice. So now I would have to say Clark! Clark! Nice! Nice! Cree? I'm probably going to Spellman, I have to be honest. <laughs> Spellman? Spellman? Perfect choice. It was so nice, I'd do it twice. <laughs> Since I got inducted as an honorary me member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, it was planted right here at Howard in 1920. There you go. I will be right here at HU. She's going to stay true blue. I love it. I love it. Tempest, what about you? Me? Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> oh. I personally, I. Howard's fabulous. It's what? wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> However, so, that would be my choice all day. For me, oh, it has the only real HU. It'd have been Howard. Good choice. Good choice. Special to their sponsor. I would, don't get mad. My parents met in line at registration at Shaw University. That's what I would choose. I'm sorry. I'm you guys lie, but I gotta do it this way. This is the new way of doing stuff. You don't even have to be there. Think about how much this will help dating if you have to be there at the club. If you just send a message to the club, I'll be joining you soon from the crowd. It looks like it's live, but it's not. It's a lie. Like most of life, you'll find out when you get to college, it's a lie. It's an illusion. You gotta look past the cloud when you graduate. Remember, I said that. <laughs> That's Sinbad, the man with one name. Personal note. but earlier they all talked about how you brought the comedy game and they had to bring their comedy uh, up. No. <laughs> it looks good, don't it? Yeah. Even that's funny. Wow. Well, we're just going to look at you. <laughs> and he's healing well, and he's still got them freckles, y'all. Wow. And we give him love. And I, and I think we ought to mention that um, Sinbad has faced some health challenges recently, and he has, by God's grace, overcome them. It's the first time he's been in public, and so we are graced to have him any way we can get him. You got that right. And I want to say, you all got a chance to work with him every day. And we can get him again. Maybe that's the joke. I don't know. Can you hear us? Send that. Can you hear us? Can you hear us now? Now he can hear us, but we can't hear him. Mercury retrograde. <laughs> Some of you know what I mean. But you can hear all the love you get. Are you getting all the love you get? I want to say too, so we laud him for his comedy genius, but I want you all to know how kind he is. I used to tour with him, I was his opening act uh, on the road years and years ago, and so he's not only funny, but he's kind and deserves all the love that we can give him at any given time. Let's give him some more love. Sit back! Alright, kind and generous. Let's get to some more questions, please. More questions? More questions. Another question from the... What else? Oh, off-stage relationships. 
uh, how have your offstage relationships grown, like your characters or something along? Oh, there we okay. go. With each other grow as the show progresses. I thought that it was going to get spicy. We were going to talk about some off-camera relationships here. Yeah, that's what I thought. Sure. Sure. So, how have your off-camera relationships with each grown as the show has progressed? Thank you, Kamani. Well, Glenn is my husband. As well, he should be. He was just in awe of him. He is just such a masterful performer, just an absolutely brilliant person as a friend. So when they married Jaleesa and Colonel Taylor, first were mad at me. How you gonna do Sinbad like that? How you gonna do Walter like that? Whatever. But we got married, made a baby, and in the, on the show. His real wife is one of my dearest friends, and uh, I just have nothing but love and respect and regard for a man that has become one of the most special people in my life. Mr. Well, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it. So, um, and Andrew, you know, Daryl and Kadeem are very, we're best friends, and Jasmine and I was definitely love at first sight. We were joined at the hip. And Kadeem and Jasmine had to play boyfriend and girlfriend, and Kadeem was my first love. And so, and, it, and then all of a sudden I was kissing his best friend. <laughs> so it was very messy and incestuous, but... Uh, but, it, but you know, it, we're actors. And it was, I have to say, we faced it with such maturity. And I never felt any jealousy of any kind because, you know, after they'd kiss, we'd go hang out. And, you know, and then, and then we'd make out and they'd go hang out. I mean, hey, it's college, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Wow. Keep it real. Um, but it was beautiful. I mean, you know, in, in that way, it just developed such a beautiful, tight relationship. We all hang out on purpose. Daryl is the godfather to Kadeem's daughter. Jasmine and I, both of our firstborn daughters are born on the very same day. So there's a, a and, and also it's, I mean, lots of people talk about cast being close, but this one really is. We really know what's going on with each other. The love is real and we will be together forever, and we have this beautiful show to make. Daryl Bell is my little brother. I adopted him on the show. We've been close ever since. My golf buddy. He lets me win a game every once in a while. But we have a great time playing golf and talking and pondering the nature of the business and so on and so forth. And I just couldn't be prouder of, of him for what he's contributed to make this for all of you happen. He's the one who's really responsible for us all getting together and bringing this to us. D-Bell! This is D-Bell's production. Can I tell them the name of the company? You tell them the name of your company. Go ahead. Blacktacular. Blacktacular Entertainment. That's right. I, I got this. This is one of the joys of my life to be able to produce this tour. When we were all working together on set, when it was time, once we were wrapped, you would hear, "Later, I'm out. Hurry up, whatever." I never hear "I love you so much" than I do when I'm with them now. When we leave, our group chats all in "Love you, love you, bye, I love you, I love you." We share the love with each other deeply in that. And so uh, that has grown. And so Glenn did it this morning. Glenn made us all cry this morning, so I'm going to keep it together tonight. But it's rare that you get to work with your heroes. Let's
legends. Glenn originated his role in Raising in the Sun. Yeah. And this morning he shared with us, he's the last one in that cast still alive. And he said to us, one day there will be someone who will be the last one in our cast. <laughs> So not only do we spend this time together more deeply, but I think of all the times when I came out of college, I, I was studying to be an economics major. I was going to be an investment banker and work with my dad. I had not formally trained. My training was on the set of a different world, and I used to watch the internal work. So, it is one of the, to know that you made your mentor proud, matters. It's, it's not an artistic answer, but there are forces, there are systems in place that are doing their very best to erase our voices and minimize our presence as people of color in this world. So I couldn't be more serious. If you want to maintain legacies like what we've created, if you want to set the foundation for your own legacy and for the people who are watching you and coming up after you, I encourage you, I implore of you to vote and take it seriously. Because forces are working to do their very best to even erase us yes. from our own American history and tell us not only do we not belong, but it never really happened. We never really contributed, and that's nothing but a lie. It's a bold-faced lie. So pay attention to what's happening in the world today, and use your power, use your voice, vote, because that's how we keep shows like this alive, stories like this alive, us in a position of economic power in this country, that we can keep telling our stories with our own authentic voices. Yeah. whether it's on a show or not, because it has to happen in real life for the show to happen, right? Anyone else want to take that on? I would say, um, after you vote, my actors in here, my writers in here, create. You can do it. This is the blueprint. You can do it, just copy and paste. You can do it. You're living it now, so do it. You have the power, you have the knowledge. You've seen the, you've seen the light, you've seen the way. So you can, you really can. Issa Rae shit, you can do it. Thank you for being for that. Now more than ever, the power's in your hand. You have a, 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 a smartphone in your hand. Create. Creators create, writers write, actors act. Get together and do it together. And who knows what we'll have. We'll be watching and waiting. You wanted to say I just wanted to add someone um, that's here tonight and is a teacher at Howard that impacted my life. She was my gram teacher when I was at Alvin Ailey. Pat Thomas. <laughs> But I was 17, I was away from home, and I was starting to lose it. I was getting depression and crying in class, and she would take me out in the hallway and talk to me. So impact can be very personal, but change the whole trajectory of somebody's life. And I thank you, Pat, so much. The impact is in your hands as well. Would you all like to say any final words before we bid you adieu? Anything? Anything? This is so much love. Thank you guys for this love. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, I give you a different world.
Where they at? Where they at? Chase, where they at? Chase. We have a special. We have a very special gift giveaway. So 30 years later, I decided to take advantage of these flip-up glasses that I wore. And I want to give a, a pair out to some lucky student here. Now, what's my question? Who knows what Dwayne Wayne's mother's first name was? Get my mic back